Welcome to Art Starts Explores, our province of play. My name is Kay Slater, and I'm the gallery coordinator and preparator at Art Starts in Schools. Every month, we pick a new theme to explore together through art making and play. In these workshops, you can watch along any time you have time to make, or listen, or just watch. We encourage young people, families, and creative people of all ages to join us every week on Saturdays at 11 a.m. as we release a new episode. These videos are for you. Whether you want to join us on Saturday when they become available or any time you want to make. We're so glad you're watching. Have you missed a week? Check out artstarts.com slash explores dash online or any of our videos on YouTube or Facebook to check out an episode you've missed. Okay, let's explore together. Before we begin making, let's review the three rules of explores. We've got rules in quotes here because they're less rules and more like guidelines or things that we like to have in mind before we start making together. First is respect. We practice respect for ourselves by checking in with ourselves every day before we start making. Maybe we didn't have a good night's sleep or we're feeling really good today. Whatever it is, we want to take the time to check in with ourselves. We also practice respect by doing the same thing for each other. And if we're not making alone, we're making with other grown-ups or other youth or friends or classmates. We want to practice respect by asking them how they're feeling as well, so we can be mindful of each other while we make together. Another way we practice respect is with our tools. That can be about putting them away when we're all finished or using them safely. If somebody else is waiting for a turn to use a tool, we can use our words or our signs and share. We can respect each other by asking how long they'll need the tool so we can move on to something else, or if we need it now, we can let them know when we will be done and tell them we will pass them the tool when we're finished. We can also practice respect by acknowledging the land. So this space that you see here is my studio space. And I'm on the stolen or unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations as an uninvited guest on these lands. One of the ways I practice respect is by acknowledging where I'm coming from and to be respectful of the lands, waters, and to the indigenous people who are here and who have been here since time immemorial while I have access to these lands. You can practice respect by finding out the territories and lands where you are watching and making from today, and by being the best guest you can and respecting the host nations, the lands, and waterways where you live. The second rule is that nothing is for keeps. I encourage you whenever possible to take things from the recycling bin. You can take paper that's already been drawn on, or has writing on the back, or is ripped, and then you don't have to feel worried about ripping it up yourself, or crumpling it, or just trying something out. It doesn't have to be good or perfect the first time, because it's not for keeps. And when we're all finished, I encourage you to take it apart. That helps really make it so that it isn't for keeps. Because if you know you're gonna take it apart at the end, you don't have to make any finished thing. You can try all the things and ways of making. Our last rule is no expectations. If we're not expecting something to turn out good or even to turn out bad, we're open to it going in a whole bunch of different ways. And that means that all respectful and creative ideas are good regardless of what happens after we try something. If you already know how something is going to turn out, if you've done it before, we can be open to trying something completely new and practice surprise. And if it doesn't turn out, that's okay. It's not for keeps. These are the three rules that we like to keep in mind when we explore together every week. Okay, let's get making together.
Hello everyone and welcome to another week of Art Starts Explores. We're going to continue our exploration of equivalence. And if you joined us last week, uh, you have already started to explore equivalence and if this is your first week with us, welcome. Equivalence is when we explore something that is equal but not the same. And so we started to talk about that last week, but I wanted to go into it a little bit more. And by, um, I think the easiest way for me to explain this is to use math. And so you probably have seen two plus two before. And if you have learned any math, you know that the answer is four. But one plus three is also equal to four. And so that's what I mean when I'm talking about equals two, but they're not the same. The marks aren't the same. The, um, the group isn't the same. So for example, if I had two pens and two sticky pads. If I had, I got lots of sticky pads here, so I'm gonna go, if I have three sticky pads and one pen, I'm using the same things and they equal four but they're not the same. Even this four of the, here, I'll bring this up a little higher. Even this four of the sticky pads is not the same as this four of the pens. So they're equal in number, in quantity, but they're not the same. And that's what we're exploring in art making. So last week, what we did was we took a famous painting by Emily Carr, and then we took some markers and we made, uh, we made our version of it. We were exploring different things that we noticed and we saw. We asked questions based on our own experience um, and things that we might see or know by living in the same place but we didn't, we don't live at the same place at, or so this, hurry, we don't live at the same time as Emily Carr did. And even if we had found the specific tree or forest that she was walking through, it's still different because it's our body at that time. So it's equal. They're both valued. They're both important experiences, but they're not exactly the same. Last week, we also talked a little bit about copying. And so we took that picture and we copied it. And at the beginning, I talked about feelings of what it would feel like if somebody was to copy your work without asking for permission at the beginning. And I talked about how um, you can feel um, frustrated if you go through uh, the work and you make something that's really cool, that's a copy of something else, that time that you took, the materials, the pencils and pens, the, the, um, the amount of hours that you took to copy that thing and to learn that thing, you might make something really amazing, but it's, not, it's still not yours. The labor that you did, the, the time that you did to make that thing, that was, that was yours that you spent, but the idea and the concept, or sometimes the culture that you are copying to learn more about that doesn't in any way make it so that you can um, show or own or say that that was yours, even though you did the work. Um, here on uh, occupied and stolen territory of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh, which is where this studio is right now that you're watching, um, the indigenous people and indigenous people all over the world have had their, um, their materials, their goods, their culture stolen and taken 
and reappropriated or used. And so it's really important, uh, especially if you have the opportunity in your classrooms to have an Indigenous knowledge keeper or artist come in and talk about um, visuals and visual arts. Um, if you are nearby where I live, you might get to learn more about totem poles. Um, even if you were to make something or take photographs of it, if you're not part of the Indigenous community, if you are not practicing Indigenous culture, you really can't, even if you make something that's really, really cool and you want to honor and you want to appreciate um, and show your respect, it's really important that we don't ever um, make something from a culture that is not our own and then tell people that it is ours. In this space here at Explores, where we're practicing together and nothing is for keeps, if you wanted to copy something that was not yours, to learn more about it, to ask questions like, how did they make that mark? Or make that color? Or get that, um, that light to look that way in a picture? That's absolute, those are absolutely the questions that you wanna be asking while we're exploring together. But that's also why when we're all finished, we take the knowledge with us and not the actual work. And it kind of gives us a freedom right here to be able to copy and try different things without ever showing anybody else. Okay, so those are a couple of things to think about when we are exploring equivalence. And there are lots of communities beyond the Indigenous community or many Indigenous communities who have their works stolen. And so it's just always important for us to be considering the, uh, the people and the culture um, of the works that we're looking at before we copy and we try new things. I'm gonna put some of this stuff away so we've got a bit more work or a bit more space to work with. And you might have already spied one of the stickies that I pulled out. Oh, here, I'm gonna change it so that it says equal but not the same at the top. You may have spied that I put down the word words. And so this week, what we're gonna do is we're going to explore equivalence using words. Last week we tried mark making, and now we're gonna try words. And really, words are mark making too, right? I had to make marks on this page to be able to create, or to, for you to be able to read this words. So if we think about it, I've got this cup here mug. It's got different colors on it. It's kind of cool mug. And so if I was trying to take one of my stickies and I was going to write mug. There you go. So once again, equal, but not the same, right? This means this, but we had to, we had to explore. We had to go to school. We had to learn, or, or we had to learn from somebody else that these letters meant this thing, because really all they are, all it is is a piece of paper and all it is is, is some markers. And all it was, was the letter M-U-M. -M. And what's the letter M? It's just a mark that we made that had these kind of weird sharp lines. And that's one of the cool things about equivalence is that when you're making, um, when you're, my cat just jumped off to the side. Uh, when we're making equal parts, we're able to then look at all these different pieces that when we're looking at something on its own, when we're looking at a really cool and famous picture, we might look at it and go, oh, I couldn't ever do that. That's really complicated because we're looking at the whole thing. We're looking at the finished piece. But when we start exploring equivalence and we start picking out things that we can see, things we can copy, things we can do, then it starts being easier for us to really examine and look at and ex explore ways that we can uh, make copies. Okay, so mug. I mean, I mean, you saw me 
when I made the sticky over here, even that needs mug, doesn't it? Even though I've, I've um, ripped this paper apart, one of my favorite things to do is ripping paper, but you knew, or at least you saw me when I went M U G, right? That that spells mug. So if we know that that is equal, isn't that equal to? Isn't that equal to? What about this or this? <laughs> right? All of a sudden we can play around with um, these, these different sides to see how far we can change these things and still have them be equivalent, have them be equal. Because we already are working from the fact that they're not the same. So we really have a lot of place that we can play on either side of that equation. I could draw it again. I could write it again. I wrote mug like this, but what if I was going to, I'm going to use the pink sticky again. What if I was going to write mug? What about now? Does it still, is it still equal? Yeah. I just used lowercase. And if I was to bring this in and make it uppercase, or uh, the first letter to be title case. Making all of these different changes, because I can on this side, I get to explore all the different ways that I can express or share the idea of mug. And this is just in English. What if I wanted to write, um, what if I wanted to write in French? What if I wanted to sign it? What if I, I had already said, let me bring my sticky over here again. What if I wanted to just draw an icon that represents it? Right? The way that you're looking at it right now, that doesn't look the same, does it? No, it's on its side. Um, the handle is over here. The handle's bigger than it is on this side. But these are, these are equal, aren't they? I mean, as far as looking at them goes, could I drink out of this? I can't, I can't drink out of this one, or at least I can't drink out of it like this. Maybe if I was to fold it up. There we go. So are these the same now? Here, I'll, I'll go a little bit further. Uh, hold, here, I'm gonna take the sticky parts off of my sticky over here. There we go. Maybe one more. Okay. And then I'm gonna go like this. Oh, here, I'll, I'll curl it this way. Well, I don't know if this is going to work. I'm just trying some things out. That's what Explores is all about. What happens if I try this? Okay. There we go. It doesn't really want to stick. Kind of though. Oh, what if I bring it over here? <laughs> it really doesn't want to stick.
I'm gonna keep trying though. Okay, here we go. There's my there's my mug. Right? What about now? Are they equivalent now? If I was to try and drink something out of this, I actually have my tea over here. Oh, I'm spilling everything. There you go. Right? It's holding some liquid in here. I don't know for how long it's gonna hold liquid in here. But there you go. So yes, this piece of paper is equal, but it's not the same. So this is what's fun about exploring equivalence is that we really get to think um, and see how far we can go. What, what, can we, what can we do with any idea? How far can we go? Is it possible to make something the same out of just paper? Now I'm gonna get myself a napkin, one second. When I'm all done cleaning, or sorry, all done playing and exploring, I will put that, I'll put that away and I'll wipe down my surface. Okay, I'm gonna leave that over there to the side. So there we go. So we started with mug and I, I wrote something on that side. One of my coworkers and colleagues, very cool Elise at Art Starts. Elise is a roller skater which I have a lot of appreciation for. I really like to roller skate too. And Elise said that uh, one of her favorite paintings is by Monet, also known as the Water Lilies. I don't know if you've seen this before, but um, Monet painted quite a few different paintings on the topic of water lilies. And here I'm gonna zoom in a little bit very, very long canvases, outdoor colors. If you've ever had the chance to see uh, water with water lilies on them. So this is just one example right here. And so um, because uh, Elise and I were talking about equivalence, uh, we agreed that I was going to use one of her favorite paintings this week. So there it is, there's, there's the water lilies. Um, this, this version is actually called clouds because do you see how the clouds, the white area over here is uh, reflected in the water. And so the water lilies can be seen on top of the water but the clouds can be seen on top of it as well. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this famous painting and we're going to do an equivalent in words. One of the other really cool things about practicing uh, equivalence in words is when you bring your artwork, so right now we're just, we're just playing, but let's say you, you draw something really cool, you paint something really cool, you sculpt something really cool, and you wanna put it online. You wanna put it on a website, or you wanna share it on social media, or even you wanna email it to somebody. What we wanna do when we share things publicly is that we don't know who's gonna see the work. We don't know how their eyesight is. We don't know how it's gonna show up on the page for them. Maybe their internet connection isn't the same as yours. Maybe their monitor shows things in a slightly different color. And so by practicing being able to describe the things that you see or that you make, when you put them up online, allows it to be more accessible to more people, people who might not be able to see it the same way as you do. And so to practice making image descriptions, to be able to write out what you see, um, it, really, it really does take practice. You gotta, you gotta really look, and you might know the piece of work that you just did here instead of stickies, I think. I'm gonna save my stickies, I'm gonna get some paper, I jumped over that step this week. Usually I like to ask at the beginning of making if you have any paper or mark making tools. Uh, I got this in the mail recently, some really nice pieces of paper that I ripped up. There we go, that's a little bit easier. And I'm gonna keep using a Sharpie because that's a bit easier to see. So I'm gonna use that Sharpie instead. There we go, okay. So what I was saying is you have to practice this skill. Even though you made the work and you might know it, 
um, really intimately, really closely, really, um, you're really familiar with what you did because you made it, especially if it just was out of your, um, out of your imagination. The act of changing something that you can show someone to something that someone has to read is a different skill. So what I like to do when I'm practicing at the beginning of making a word equivalent to something that I can see is I like to write down all the words that I think of um, or that I see or that come to mind when I'm looking at a picture. So I'm going to start writing down some words um, that I can think of when I look at the painting Water, uh, water Lilies, um, The Clouds. If you have a different painting or picture or object that you want to be practicing and describing, go for it. But I'm going to turn off my voice for a second. I'm going to write down all the words I can think about uh, when I look at this painting. Okay, so I just wrote until I could fill up this page. I probably could keep going. I didn't really write how it makes me feel. I, you know what, I'm gonna add the word soft. I'm going to add the word quiet. Mm. I think that's what I'm gonna, I'm gonna put there. So there you go. So I wrote down a whole bunch of words. What did I write down? I wrote down colors blue, purple, white, black, green. At the end here, I was thinking about it. I was thinking about the painting and how it made me feel. And I thought about kind of soft breezes that happen when I'm sitting by a lake that allows me to see a reflection. Oh, I'm gonna write down reflection. And this work, right? You can keep adding to this list as you go along. I thought about uh, the quiet that happens, that quiet stillness. Still. About, again, how, how the soft breeze and how the water has to be really still um, um, for the reflection to show up that clearly. I thought about the sky that I could see. I thought about how it was water that we were looking at. I'd written down reflection when I was thinking about still back there. I was thinking that it's a painting. So even though it's a representation, it's a painting of sky and water and clouds. There we go. Um, but really it's a painting. And what kind of paint do they use? It's oil paint. Uh, Monet was using oil paint. And I was thinking about the difference between the dark uh, trees that you can see over here, or maybe these are um, part of the shoreline or shadows. So the darkness and then the light in the center that makes me want to look over in the middle of the painting more than at the side of the painting. I thought it had to be daytime for us to be able to see the blue in the sky. I thought about how um, this is probably a lake, um, or at least I've seen lakes when I think about this painting. The lily pads that are in both the name of this painting, but also that you can see that are painted on top of the um, of the lake um, that I got feelings of it being wet so even though um, I you know this isn't a wet surface when I touch it um, and it's just a painting and the painting isn't wet because it was paint or it was painted a, a long time ago in fact it was painted a, about a hundred years ago um, but it still makes me think of 
of wet, of the water, of, of lakes. It made me think of all the marks that I could see as I really started to focus on the painting. It, it was easy, especially if you get really close to it, that you start looking at all of the little marks on the page. And then they're less about what you can see when you look at the whole picture, but about what they're made up of. And that made me think of the strokes that you would have, um, that um, Claude Monet would have had to do with his hand while he was adding the strokes to the page or adding the paint to the page. So there we go. There is my equal sign. I couldn't have this list of words or I couldn't have generated this exact list of words without this painting. I could have generated a different list of words and I could have probably found another painting that all of these words match. But this experience of me writing all of these words were because of this painting. So they are equal, but they're not the same. They're interchangeable. I could rip this up. I could put these words in different, uh, different orders and they'd still be able to be put on either side of the um, equal sign, but they're not exactly the same. All right, so now I have all these cool words to work with. If I was gonna describe this online, I might be able to now use all these words to create a sentence that helps someone who uh, might not be able to see it. The, the picture might, show, might not show up when they're uh, visiting online. Um, they might not be able to see it uh, because they're low vision or blind. They might not be see, able to see it because they have a headache that day and they just it's easier for them to read rather than to look at the picture. Or maybe they're really distracted and somebody else is reading out the text to them. Lots of different reasons why an image description is such a useful and excellent skill to practice and write um, as an equivalent to anything that you ever make. So let's try this. I'm looking at all these colors here. So I'm gonna go an oil painting of a colorful lake that reflects the uh, bright daytime sky full of Clouds, whoops, spelled that wrong, clouds. There you go, right? So now I can take those words away. An oil painting of a colorful lake that reflects the bright daytime sky full of clouds. Right, that's the same thing. That's on the, that, sorry, that's not the same thing. That's equal, right? That, that equals that. I can keep going. I think, uh, I think I was missing, what am I missing? I said lake. I said reflect, I said daytime. Oh, you know what? I think I need to talk about the lilies, even though all this other information is there. I think I need to talk about the water lilies. You know, somebody might not be able to see this picture and go, well, why, why was it called the water lilies? And I can go uh, a colorful lake and I'm gonna put, because remember, this isn't for keeps. This is just us trying things out. I'm going to put an arrow here and say, I wanted to say an oil painting of a colorful lake with lily pads and flowers, right? And so that now goes in there and I could rewrite that again, but again, this is just for trying things out. You could do this with any picture. You could do it with a picture of your face. If you had one of your school pictures or you had a selfie and you wanted to put that down there, you could see how you could describe it. You could do a couple of different selfies of yourself and then you could start picking out words that are in common that you find in all of your pictures. Finding words that are able to describe you and your, your appearance. Practicing this skill so that when you find things online and you want to make your work more inclusive, so more people who might have challenges in checking out the work 
Uh, for all those different reasons I was talking about, when you can do a text or word equivalent, that's a, that's a really important and useful skill. There are lots of ways that we can explore equivalents, and I've just explored one way today. Come on back in a couple of weeks. We're going to continue to explore equivalents a little bit later in May. Um, and if, you, if you're making any really cool stuff that you want to share with us, we'd love to hear about it. We post things every Saturday on our uh, website at artstarts.com slash explores dash online, on our Facebook page at artstarts, or on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com uh, slash artstarts. So like I like to do every week, I'm gonna keep my camera running just a little bit longer while I clean up my space and practice respect so that I'm all ready to make when we get to meet again in a couple of weeks. All right, take care.